and you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2 p.m. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. From the Amazon basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Howdy, folks, and welcome to today's edition of Terra Verde. I'm your host, Jason Mark. Happy Earth Day. You'd think we'd be doing something special for this 46th annual Earth Day, but you know what? Here at Terra Verde, every day is Earth Day, so we're just going with our regular programming. Last month, on March 9th, hundreds of people rallied on the steps outside the federal courthouse in Eugene, Oregon. They were there to support a novel and ambitious legal effort by 21 young people who are suing the federal government for failure to take sufficient action to address global climate change. Inside the courthouse, a U.S. magistrate was hearing arguments from the Justice Department and fossil fuel corporations who are hoping to dismiss the young people's suits. Some legal experts were skeptical about the kids' case, a tough sell is how one environmental attorney described the young plaintiff's arguments to me. But maybe not, because on April 8th, Judge Thomas Coffin allowed the case to proceed. No matter how it turns out, the suit is already precedent-setting. U.S. government attorneys will be forced to make a case in court for how the continued extraction and combustion of fossil fuels doesn't harm the interests of future generations of citizens. Talk about a tough sell. Well, here to talk about the case today is its lead attorney, Julia Olson. She's a co-founder of Our Children's Trust, the organization mounting the lawsuit. Also with us, speaking by phone from uh, Oregon, is Jacob uh, LaBelle, one of the plaintiffs. He's an 18-year-old student, poet, and singer from Roseburg, Oregon, whose family farm is threatened by rising global temperatures. Julia, Jacob, welcome to Terra Verde. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, glad to have you, Jacob. Um, Julia, let's start with you. Can you just tell us a little bit about the case, about kind of where this idea for this, this uh, again, innovative um, legal challenge to the U.S. government's, uh, you know, relative inaction on climate change came from? Yeah, I think the idea primarily came from watching environmental law or statutory law just really not do the job to result in comprehensive emission reductions at the national level here in the United States. And there's been a lot of hard work by a lot of people, including the Sierra Club, for example, in stopping new coal fire power plants. But what we are lacking at the federal level is a comprehensive plan that would call for the reduction of emissions at levels that scientists say are necessary to protect our climate system. And so in looking at this from a comprehensive um, standpoint and from the standpoint of young people whose rights are at stake, we really turn to the public trust doctrine and the U.S. Constitution, specifically the Fifth Amendment, which protects our rights to life, liberty, and property. And so looking at those fundamental laws, the laws that really govern how our government is supposed to act and with respect to its citizens, including future generations, was the starting point for the case. And, and the public trust doctrine, what exactly is that and, and how does it work? The public trust doctrine comes to us from ancient Roman law through the King of England, and it's it's a law that's embedded in uh, legal systems throughout the world. And, and it's really simple. It basically says that governments act as trustees over essential natural resources like air and water, and that they have an obligation to protect those resources for not just the present generation, but for future generations, and not allow the impairment of those resources, and also not alienate them from the public realm. So we're not allowed to privatize our air and water that's essential to survival. Um, I understand. So, so you've been sort of spearheading the, the federal case, but our children's trust and, and some of your other uh, partners, you guys have also been mounting legal challenges in, in all 50 states. How have those gone so far? It, 
Well, we're starting to see some really positive decisions. So we've been doing this for about five years now, helping young people bring actions against their state and national governments, both here in the United States and also globally. And what we're seeing is courts are beginning to respond. We're educating the courts not only about climate science, but also about the rights of young people. And the public trust doctrine is very deeply rooted in our state laws around the country. And so, for example, we have a great case in Washington. Eight young people have sued the Department of Ecology, and they have succeeded in getting just a really transformative decision from a judge up there. And we're now going back to her actually next week, asking her to order the Department of Ecology to do a rulemaking to reduce emissions in the state of Washington according to the scientific need to do so. You know, uh, I'm no attorney, I'm no legal expert, but I did read um, the uh, um, the ruling in 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 from from Judge uh, Coffin, and, and and maybe I was reading too much into it, but there there was almost a tone of like self evidence, like he was sort of saying these are what the the, the plaintiffs are asking for, and it's sort of self evident their their claims. I mean, is that is that what you mean when you say the courts are responding? I, I think Judge. Coffin really got the heart of the claims that are brought forward by these kids in their complaint, and he's allowing them to go forward. And one of the most profound things he said in the opinion is he said the intractability of the debates before Congress and state legislatures and the alleged valuing of short-term economic interests despite the cost to human life necessitates a need for the courts to evaluate the constitutional parameters of the action of our government. So he is really grasping that there are constitutional rights at stake, and our government is discriminating against these young people with respect to their rights. And essentially because of uh, you know, the, the, the partisan polarization in, in Washington, and, and again, a, you know, a, a, a huge majority of the Republican Party still in, 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 in basic total denial on climate science, he's saying because there's inaction from the legislative branch, um, this has to be dealt with by the courts. That's right. And we have evidence that we will bring forward in this case when we get to trial showing that the federal government has known for for over 50 years that by continuing to burn fossil fuels, it would result in apocalyptic change, catastrophic change. These are the words our government was using in 1965. And in the past five decades, we also will put forward evidence that there has been a collusion of interest between the fossil fuel industry and the federal government and our decision makers. And that collusion to ignore science and to continue exploiting fossil fuels and make our country dependent on a fossil fuel energy system is threatening the survival of young people and future generations. That's what is at the core of this case. And I have to say that's one thing that's been so interesting about this case. When you first filed it um, back in the fall of 2015, I think it was, I, I, I'll admit I maybe was a little bit of a hater. I was thinking, well, I don't know if this is going to go very far. But then you've, you've become this proxy battle, right? I mean, you had the, the fossil fuel industry essentially, you know, siding with the federal government in trying to dismiss this case. That's almost another evidence of not maybe collusion, but certainly of, of shared interests. Well, they are. They're sitting side by side with the Obama administration defending this case against the kids. And what they said in one of our early hearings um, in making the argument for why they should be able to be co-defendants, they said that if the plaintiffs win this case, it will drastically change the way we do business and it will make fossil fuels eventually obsolete. Yeah. Um, I want to bring into the conversation. We've got one of the 21 plaintiffs uh, joining us on the on the show today. That's Jacob LaBelle. He's an 18 year old from Roseburg, Oregon. Jacob, how did you become involved in in this suit in the Our um, Children's uh, Our Children's Trust lawsuit? Right. So um, I I grew up on the like you just said. I grew up in a in a farm in Roseburg, Oregon, and I've had a very deep connection with um, with nature and with a lifestyle that um, that does not excessively extract and lead us into um, these these situations of pollution and climate destabilization that we see today. Um, and I think coming from that viewpoint, um, seeing what is happening in the past years, um, just a quick recap. 2015 uh, was the hottest year on record, and then that was breaking the record that was held by 214, 
uh, for average global temperature, hottest year on record ever recorded. Um, and then the, all these, uh, you know, the month of, of February to 16 was was also um, also bro- broke all historic records for temperatures. And then and then the month of March broke them again. And so and and that translates to me uh, what I'm seeing here in Oregon on my farm. It translates to um, to drought, extreme drought getting worse and worse um, as we see in California it um, it translates to um, heat waves that make it hard to to work on the farm it makes you know it, it makes it changes our very lifestyle um, and so and and that it doesn't just stop there you know I've, I've been doing a lot of research um, looking at the news and Facebook and and you know we're entering the sixth mass extinction of all um, species on earth the scientists have confirmed that and it's mostly due to climate change and human activity and so from the viewpoint of the young person who has you know my whole life ahead of me in this world um, it's definitely very um, very sobering and so that's kind of what prompted me to um, to get involved in, in his drive me um, to is driving my action this lawsuit more specifically um, when I first heard of this lawsuit it was through my activism against uh, something called the Jordan Cove project which uh, had been proposed in uh, southern Oregon it's a, um, a proposed natural gas facility um, it, which would have involved a 232 mile um, pipeline going through about a mile from my farm and a uh, liquefaction factory in uh, Coosa Bay Oregon that would if built be the biggest um, carbon emitter of uh, greenhouse gases um, in the entire state of Oregon, and um, so through my, I got involved in, in fighting that project and and seeing how it was so blatantly obvious that this was a bad idea that we were building something that we, we would build something that would lock in um, carbon emissions in place for the next you know 40 years, um, and seeing that the federal agencies in charge of handing out those permits and giving that company the go through landowners' um, properties without permission and build these infrastructure, and they were, were permitting um, all these things without taking into account our future, without taking the, into account the future of our environment, uh, without taking climate change into account. And and so that was really a shocker for me. That was, you know, to see that happening. And I actually went to Washington, D.C. and fasted for five days in front of the, the Federal Energy Regulatory Agency, which is in charge of... of, of <laughs> me to get involved in this lawsuit. And so, Jacob, when you talk about global ch- climate change unfolding, uh, you know, right now, obviously, uh, in the present, but also in your lifetime, when you talk about the sixth mass extinction, you're essentially kind of making a case that you've got an additional, as a young person um, who is essentially going to spend your whole life in, in living on a, a, on a planet that's been changed by human civilization, that you've got an extra moral authority. Is that, is that kind of the case that you're making here? That is that is pretty much I think what we what we are saying with this lawsuit. I mean, with that we have a constitutional right um, to live in a safe and and a healthy uh, planet, on a safe and healthy world. And the government has has a level of, of responsibility to um, to preserve those to preserve those those rights that we have to, um, as we state in the lawsuit, life, liberty, and property, uh, which depend in a very fundamental way on on uh, on a stable climate because. Uh, as we've we've seen repetitively from uh, statements from uh, you know even the CIA and and the U.S. government governments around the world, climate destabilization isn't just affecting our environment; it affects social movement, it affects war, it affects um, it affects our entire human fabric of our civilization in a way. And so, yes, I think that is exactly um, the power of the argument that we are saying that uh, young people and there are there are kids in this case who are you know eight nine years old um, up to I'm one of the oldest. I'm, I'm 19 right now, and um, that that idea that we we do there we do have some some um, that, that that right, and we do have that moral uh, that moral weight. We bring that moral weight to the discussion. And I'm curious, Jacob, when you're talking with folks, um, how do they respond to that? I mean, again, you guys with our Children's Trust are essentially making this claim for intergenerational justice, sort of intergenerational responsibilities. When you're talking with 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 folks there, uh, you know, as you've explained this case, do folks get that? Do they sort of understand that there there may be uh, responsibilities that we sort of hold for the future, or is that is that something that's kind of a hard rhetorical claim to make? 
I don't think the claim that um, that that we have a responsibility towards future generation, at least from my point of view, hasn't met with much much challenges. Um, the 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 fact is that people. The fact that I'm running up against when I'm talking to people is that a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of us aren't educated, or maybe we don't we 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 don't want to be, or we don't listen to the facts and to the scientists. And I'm pretty sure the media and the government has a very large role, a very large responsibility for this uh, state of affairs. But when people don't get the magnitude of what we're what we're facing, when they don't get that the you know 95% of of the Great Barrier Reef has just been hit by bleaching and may die out in the next couple of years, when they don't get that the Arctic is melting at unprecedented rate because they haven't they haven't been um, they haven't been exposed to that, then it's hard it's harder to make that 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 claim. And so, um, kind of tying it back to what we're doing with the lawsuit, I see this also as as being very powerful on the level of of education, where we're inspiring people all over the world to dig deeper because they're being faced with this argument that you know they throw this rhetoric around about saving the planet for for future generations and thinking of our kids. But what this case actually does is it takes that rhetoric and it brings it into within the legal sphere, it brings it into application and that's a whole different thing because you, now you're challenging, you know, corporations who um, who make their profit off this, you know, oil and gas companies who have intervened in court. And so that's kind of um, that's kind of one of the, the goals that I see for this lawsuit also is other than what we're actually seeking in court is also to, to educate people so that they they, they are more um, they are more pushed to, to action in a way. Sparking conversations like this one. This is Jason Mark. You're tuned to Terra Verde. Today we're talking about a landmark legal challenge from a group of young people who are suing the federal government for infringing on their rights, their constitutional rights, by failing to address climate change. That speaking just there was Jace Jacob LaBelle. He's a 19-year-old student who is one of the plaintiffs in the case, speaking to us from uh, Roseburg, Oregon. In studio here in Berkeley is Julia Olson, an attorney from Our Children's Trust. This is the organization leading the litigation. Um, Julia, I guess I'm I'm wondering though the government's gonna you know today we've got heads of state and foreign ministers in New York City at the UN um, signing the the Paris Accords, which um, does have an express goal of wanting to uh, you know staunch emissions and keep the globe at uh, an express goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius total you know average rise. Isn't the U.S. government gonna come back and say we are doing something? We've signed the climate, we've signed the Paris Accords. We're working on the clean power plan. Um, what is what is you and, and your fellow attorney's response to that? Yeah, I I think the Paris Agreement is it's important in in some respects, and one of those respects is that for the first time the world leaders have agreed that a two degree Celsius target, which was chosen years ago and wasn't scientifically grounded, is probably not safe. And so now they are looking at a 1.5 degrees Celsius level of warming. Dr. Hansen says that over the long term... Dr. That's Dr. James Hansen, the former NASA climatologist, now at Columbia University. That's right. And he and his colleagues have shown in papers now that really 350 parts per million is the level of CO2 that's safe. And over the long term, a one degree Celsius rise is really the maximum that we should hope to strive for um, in the long run. And we may shoot up to 1.5, but going anywhere near two degrees is catastrophic for humanity. Humans have never lived in a two degree Celsius warmer world. And so what I want to make clear about the Paris Accord is that it does not require anything of these countries. There's nothing legally binding or enforceable in that agreement that would compel the United States to reduce emissions at any level. And in fact, it's it's a voluntary compliance kind of situation sure. where countries submit their their proposals for how much they will reduce. And then the enforcement is purely upon them. So what we really need are enforceable actions in domestic countries. So we need courts to step in and order governments to actually reduce emissions at levels that are necessary, or we need legislation that requires it. But we need an enforceable mechanism to ensure that this will happen, given all that is at stake. As an attorney, you're no doubt uh, aware there's a huge world of difference, an ocean difference between shall and should. And I believe that the initial text of the Paris Accords had the word shall in there, which is sort of binding, and then it was switched at the 11th hour to to should, um, uh, reportedly you know, on the urging of the U.S., um, which knew it would never get a, a binding agreement through Congress. 
Uh, that's right. Right now, our, I mean, our Congress has been in stalemate for a very yeah. long time on this issue. And, you know, the world leaders in this agreement, the other thing they said, which is very telling, is that if every country did what they came to Paris and said that they would do, we're still on a trajectory to exceed three degrees Celsius or three and a half degrees Celsius of sure. warming. The commitments, the commitments are insufficient. Um, Jacob LaBelle, I'm, I'm wondering, so when you heard earlier this month that uh, this, this federal magistrate had, uh, is, is allowing your case to go forward, what was your reaction? I'm super happy, <laughs> overjoyed, <laughs> um, running around telling all my friends and my family. Um, and I think that was that was uh, very similar to, you know, we had very, very similar reactions, all of us plaintiffs, to that. Um, it's really, uh, it's historic, is, and I know we've used that word, but it's, it's, it really is, because there hasn't been anything like this before that, a, that our judicial system has, has laid out in such um, plain language um, the, that, that this is a valid argument that we are making. And like I said before, I really want to put that point out that we are going beyond rhetoric um, because our current political system is very good at at working on rhetoric rather than action. And I think a lot of that is what has led to our current uh, enormous problem and the fact that now we need to um, to drastically reduce emissions uh, much more than if we'd started working on this, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago uh, when we did know what was going to happen. And so um, to have that put in in such clear language was um, really gave me hope. And I was, I, and you know, as as I was reading this um, this this statement um, in the days around that, I, I was also reading all these these news that are coming in almost every single day on my feed about uh, record breaking temperatures every single month and and all these other things we've talked about and really um, kind of combined to give me to give me hope and to give me a real sense of urgency that this this has to happen now. We won't have a second chance. This is really an important action that we are all part of. And um, and just kind of bouncing off that idea, um, it's not just, you know, we. this action is super important, but we also need everyone to hear about this and get on board in their own way because this lawsuit that we are bringing needs to be supported by, you know, Ideally, our entire population, young people, you know, engineers, citizens, liars, uh, government officials. And Jacob, how would they support it? How, how, would, how would actually, uh, you know, Joe or Jane California listening to this show right now, living in Fresno, California, how would they go about supporting this lawsuit? Right. Well, first of all, I think I'm a very big believer that, um, you know, you you can... You can do what you love, you can um, do what you're good at and what you've dedicated yourself to and work towards um, a climate solution and an environmental solution because this climate crisis is connected to every, literally every aspect of life. It's connected to agricultural systems, it's connected to, uh, you know, military systems, um, it is, it's connected to transportation systems. And so whatever, you know, if you're an engineer, um, like we had a, a recent article in one of the biggest Tesla news uh, websites that linked our case, talked about our case and linked it to the recent um, the recent conference by Elon Musk, uh, the founder of, of Tesla Inc. Um, and and that's one example. You know, if you're an engineer or a scientist, um, if you're just a uh, even if you're just a, a citizen, you know, trying to make investments, your economic investments, uh, take them out of fossil fuel uh, companies and put them into renewable technology or um, shop smarter, start a garden. Start get involved in a community garden uh, from a more individual point of view all these things um, all these things matter and and what we are doing is 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 super important but we need to be supported by all these people all these individuals as well Julia Olson you got maybe something to add on that point I do so our children's trust is the organization that's behind these suits and it's a small nonprofit we have six people on staff and we definitely need supporters to come in and help invest in this case going forward, we have a very large trial against the biggest superpower and the fossil fuel industry coming up. And so to support these kids and to support this case, um, we welcome people to, to donate on Earth Day today. And and then I also think the other thing people can do is spread the word. So send people the link to this radio program and have people listen and start educating people about 
climate injustice is it's really an injustice of constitutional proportions. It's an intergenerational justice issue. And and everyone out there has rights under the public trust doctrine and our Constitution. And we need to start talking about that more. So when you say it's an an intergenerational injustice that I get, when you say it's an intergenerational injustice under the Constitution, I wanted you to explain a little bit more. I mean, what what exactly is the remedy you're seeking from the the U.S. government? If you win this case, I I mean, is it is it you're going to have compensatory you know damages paid to these 21 plaintiffs? Are you seeking a, a policy redress? I mean, what exactly? Is, you know, you go through trial and you win the case. What what are you hoping then the, the will happen? Yeah, so good questions. So I'll, I'll start with the first point about the intergenerational justice component. So when our founders started this country and drafted the Constitution, in the preamble, they wrote that they were setting forth these rights in this Constitution for our posterity, which is future generations. So that intergenerational justice is beautifully written in our Constitution. And and then to the second question, what the plaintiffs seek is this is not a case about damages or about money. It's purely about seeking a remedy that would require the government to have a comprehensive climate recovery plan and put policies in place that would reduce emissions at the appropriate levels, but also stop doing the things that it's doing, like allowing the extraction of fossil fuels on federal public lands, increasing the the exports and imports of fossil fuels and all of the related infrastructure. Our federal government has its hands in every aspect of our fossil fuel energy system, and they need to pull back from that and shift course dramatically. And we've covered the keep it in the ground movement here on KPFA Terra Verde, but I mean, you're essentially, you know, this is this is a legal remedy to, to basically to stop that coal, gas, oil leasing on public lands. It is. And one another piece of evidence we use in the case is there was a plan that EPA prepared in 1990 in a report to Congress and another agency within Congress prepared a similar plan. And these roadmaps called for maintaining CO2 levels at 350 parts per million, which is a special number. We're at 406 now, I believe. We are. We're over 400. And and part of that plan was a bunch of different policies, you know, readjusting our transportation system and requiring greater energy efficiency and conservation. But a big piece of the plan EPA proposed was a carbon tax. We need to put a fee on carbon. And... So in preparing a plan as a remedy in this case, if if the court orders that, the government would have to figure out what mechanisms it was going to use to decarbonize our society. And there are a lot of options, but EPA has a plan on the books from 1990 that they can look to as a starting point. Interesting. Um, Julie Olson, I guess one last question today. So what are the next steps? You've gotten uh, you've gotten through your kind of first legal hoop. What What's going to happen moving forward for you and your 21 young plaintiffs? Right now, there's a second federal judge who will be looking at the decision that came down on April 8th. The government and the industry are going to object to the decision that came down. We will file a response, and we expect that by late May or early June, we will have a final decision, and then we will be heading towards trial. And we're optimistic that's where we're headed. So we're beginning the process right now of of planning our, our trial plan and and getting the, the team together to, to make that happen because it's going to be a very important trial, a trial of the century. Jacob LaBelle, anything you want to add in the last 30 seconds here about your aspirations for this case moving forward? I just really I just really think we've achieved so much and we are going to achieve so much more and it has really inspired me. I've made some of my best friends among the co plaintiffs and they have all and our children's trust and Julia have all really inspired me to do my best in this life to, to ensure a uh, a safe world for uh, my children and future generations. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Jacob LaBelle, for sharing that spark of inspiration with us here today on Tier Ready. Thank you, Julia Olson. They are both of Our Children's Trust. Learn more about their landmark lawsuit against the federal government for inaction on climate change at ourchildrenstrust.org. That's all the time we've got for today's show. Have a great weekend. Happy Earth Day. This show and others are available online all the time at kpfa.org for your convenience. Have a great weekend. Have you 
ever consider producing a community radio show? If that's the case, please pay attention. The Pacifica National Board has approved a motion to implement five new hours of programming in Spanish per week at every station of Pacifica, which includes Houston, Los Angeles, Berkeley, Washington, D.C., and New York. If you or someone you know is interested, please send us an email to programación espanol at pacifica.org or visit your local Pacifica radio website. 